Greetings, elder vampires and baby bats from across the interweb. It is once again I, Precious Ken, the Duchess, coming at you live from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And with me, as always, I have... It's Colin hey, Skipper. Katie May. Hi, okay, wait, let's... A twofer. We fucked that up! <laughs> Woo! Yeah. That's right. No, we're on a strong start. It's fine. Normally, at this point, we do kind of what everybody's listening to. But for this interview, I'm just too excited. We're going to skip over that for this week. Although last night, I did one of my drunken 2 a.m. like 10 reviews in a night. So if you want to hear what I'm listening to, just go to Sounds and Shadows. And there is a write-up for a lot of that stuff. With us today, I have the amazing band dog tablet or at least a good portion of it with martin king and jared Lush. gentlemen it is a true pleasure to have you here with us hello you need to get out more often my friend yeah i think so <laughs> this is really really exciting i have followed both of you guys in the band you're in for a long time i mean i had agree with both chem lab who i saw long ago when I was a 16-year-old lad, it was a impressionable moment for me to see you guys back in, God, it must have been like 1990 test department for Martin. I was blown away. I just got to see last year at the Cold Waves Festival. You guys have had such an influential part, and I could probably sit here all day long and talk to you guys about the past and stories from the road, but I don't want to do that. I want to focus today on your new project of Dog Tablet. How about you tell me how the two of you met and decided, wow, this is somebody that I'm going to play music with and start this project, and how that became Dog Tablet. I have an old friend, Roberto Suave. He was in Shelley and Orphan, the bass player for Shelley and Orphan, Presence, and some other bands. We've known each other for a long time. In between being in band and touring, we worked at EMI together. In about 2014, we just we, we got together to start writing some production music. So back in the 90s, I, I was writing music for KPM, which is the KPM Music Library. So writing music for, you know, like background music for TV and stuff. Which yeah. in the 90s was a very, very lucrative business. It isn't for me anymore, <laughs> but, but lots, lots of stuff went on between 2000 and 2014. Some of it really good, some of it very bad. When it started to, when it started to get good again in 2013, 14, Bob and I got back together as friends, and um, and we started. We said, "Why well, don't we do some more production music?" We got ourselves an agent, and and, then, and we started working on that sort of thing again. Uh, in those 14, 15 years, the, the business had changed massively and we found that, you know, we were, writing, we were writing music that we wanted to have placed in particular genres of film and TV and stuff, thrillers and mainly dark programs, you are probably not surprised to know. But most of the jobs we were getting, you know, reproduce a, this chart hit. Uh, it can't sound like it, but it must be exactly like it. It doesn't take long to get bored of doing that. And, and to be honest, if I could have made a chart hit, I'd have done it a long time ago, and I'd be very rich and living somewhere hot and sunny now. Your punk um, rock soul just wouldn't allow you to, Martin. It just wouldn't. <laughs> my friend, it would have, I, I'd have sold my grandmother to have been doing <laughs> Yeah, so we were doing that, and it's quite soul-destroying. On the one hand, we were in between, in between uh, briefs. So you get a brief in, then you write something for it, you submit the brief along with however many other people they ask to submit a brief, and sometimes it gets used, sometimes it doesn't. So in between times, we were writing stuff and, and sort of trying to approach production companies who made the type of programs that we wanted. But we were building up like a catalogue of really dark, nice but dark music. And then I said to Bob, why don't we just put out an album? Use all these fantastic tracks and put out an album. Um, which is why the first album, the first Dog Tablet album, Outlaws and Strays, is an instrumental because they were all written with theme music and sort of thriller and crime in mind. So, and that's how that worked. And then uh, I can't remember how, how did I get back in? Why did we get back in touch? Can you remember why? 
Oh, sure. That's easy. There, there are a few things I can remember. Car keys, no. Glasses on top of my head, fuck no. What am I doing standing in this room? Hell no. Martin and I met in the late 90s. I mean, I knew of Martin and Test Department from way, way, way back. Because I'm old and I can say stuff like that. And we got together in the late 90s for the carnival ride that is Pig Face, where you take a mountain of talent and turn it into a molehill of comedy but it has its moments and there's some great friendships that are born out of it curse Mackey being one of them and martin being another <clears throat> and there's a whole story about curse and i because you know the old song we started out as lovers well he and i started out as fucking enemies but pig face brought us together we met on the i think it was the preaching to the perverted tour martin and i became fast friends we stayed in touch when I and started hanging out when I moved to London in 99 or 2000. And I was in and out of the studio that Martin was in, uh, the Fortress, which has got a million tales associated with it. No one will, will be surprised to learn. Yes, yeah, so we did some music together and Martin was kind enough to do the music for one of the songs it's on my solo record, Cover Girl one of the best of the songs, one of the best recreations, uh, Sinatra's Summer Wind. Then we sort of stayed loosely in touch. I was cajoled finally into putting Chem Lab back together again and in 2018, and it was this huge riot of lunacy and glory. Right when I came back, for some reason, straight out of the blue, Martin got in touch and said, hey man, I have this dog tablet track that I think you'd be really interested in. Would you be, would you be willing to sing on it? And I said, fuck yeah, because I always like working with him. He threw a track at me called The New Cold War. It was this really, this really funny thing because I love the way that he writes. It was really important to me to really woodshed the song beforehand and get it nice and tight and, and, and just you know, tweak it and fuss with it. There, so we nailed it really pretty quickly and he and Roberto were really happy and then Martin was playing me something else he said oh man I have this song hazmat working on and I listened to it and said oh oh, oh wait 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 um, um, um I'd like a slice of that too um, you know because that's pretty tasty and he said well sure I can send it to you and afterwards it turns out Roberto <laughs> said to uh, Martin he said, you know, I really don't, it doesn't need lyrics. It doesn't, I, I don't know what the fuck he would do in terms of vocals. And I, I was really excited about it. And I, once again, spent a lot of time in the woodshed, just hammering and chopping and chiseling away at it. Went to Martin's and dropped the vocals on it. Martin was like, okay, hey, fucking cool. For Roberto, Roberto was like, how the... I, yeah, I don't get, I, it just makes no sense. That's perfect. I didn't see it, which is a lovely compliment that I was actually able to add something without sort of trying to force a square peg into a round fuck. And yeah. so, yeah, and we kind of rolled from there. Beautiful. It was, um, I love it when a plan funny. comes together. Uh, I was, because we hadn't real much. And all of a sudden there was Martin. Hey man. I got this thing for you. Really? Cool. Okay. Yeah, it sort of worked out quite well, didn't it, really? In the beginning, and, and then you just couldn't <laughs> give it up. He just kept giving you that sweet, sweet goodness, and you couldn't stop. I understand. <laughs> it was quite nice, because when we put, this, when we put the second, when we decided, because the first album, that was just a, a given. We're like, oh, yeah, we've got all these tracks. Let's put them out. Second album, we're like, well, actually, now we need to write. We've still got some, but we need to write some. And then uh, I was chatting to Jenny Bellstar. I was like, oh, do you fancy doing a, some recording a couple of tracks? Well, a track, actually, is what I said to her. Gave her a track. She, record, she sent me back her rough things. And then she came over here and did the track. In, in, she's brilliant. She does stuff in like, you know, one take, two take. She comes, when, when Jen turns up to record, she comes with her phone and bang she records in one take and then she go right I'll double track these she, and then no matter how complicated the track is that she's recorded she'll double track it perfectly and then she go okay i've got she listens to her phone and goes oh, i've got this harmony you record it this harmony record it uh, and then it's done 
for I think for those two tracks, we were really lucky because I had a friend who does uh, has a voiceover studio, which they, where they do all the BBC dramas, radio dramas and stuff. He said, yeah, come on in, have a day, do as much as you can. She turned up at about 12 o'clock and by three o'clock, she'd done both tracks, all the things, all the all the harmonies. It was amazing. So we got Jen on and then Mike Reedy from Worm in Chicago. Uh, I asked him if he'd put down a track and he put down a track. I did a track with vocals, and th- and I think that's when we discovered how much we enjoyed having vocals on our music. Actually, writing a track and waiting for the vocals, as opposed to having the track, and then put. I think my dog's knocking on the door. Jordy? I think that leads in really well to the next big question I had for you guys because. When I discovered this project for you, it was for Feathers and Skin. That was the first thing I heard. It was at a time, I know you guys know about this because you contributed a track to my benefit for my cat, but right when I found that album in December was when everything was really happening. I was just really afraid for her. This album to me had such a sense of every song that I listened to on it, I picture an animal. Like the music, the lyrics, all of it had this real sense of totemism, uh, of animal spirit within the music. It slithers or it creeps or it crawls and and you really feel that and hear that and to me can kind of put myself in the mindset or eyes of a different animal. So I want to ask you one at a time, what does kind of that idea of animalism or totemism mean to you, Jared, for the lyrics and how you did them? And then Martin, for the music, how did you manage to just sync that up so perfectly to achieve the full effect of having that totemism? And did you talk about it beforehand or did it just happen naturally? We didn't talk about it as some sort of overarching theme. The music dictates the terms for me in a lot of ways. It's very image rich, it's cinematographic, and that's, I don't know, it's tremendously inspiring. So, and it has a this really organic quality to it, which is something that I find is so often lost in um, digital music. It's why I always wanted to push ChemLab to not just, you know, to be an industrial band, but machine rock, you know, the, the struggle between the quantized precision and the chaos of the guitar. The organic quality of Martin's writing really inspired completely subconsciously a lot of uh, animal imagery. You know, there's songs about birds and uh, snakes and dogs. And um, there's one that I'm working on now that's bears, but, you know, sort of fairy tale bears. It's this animalistic subcurrent that runs through it that I keep inadvertently tapping into and not something that we discussed at all but it just it works thematically uh, the whole record to me is this as, as i described it in the, the bio about the band it's this grim's fairy tale forest full of poisoned fruit and dark confections and uh these flame ridden little sections that that are inviting and yet threatening at the same time and really visual. And because the music is so visual, I tried to respond with as much uh, rich visual imagery in my writing as I could. No, I I hear that for sure. Now, Martin, uh, same to you. Was that an intent at all, that outwit to capture in this? Or is that just where these songs took you? Nothing that we do is ever intentional. Jared knows how how uh, we write things and how I write things it's I don't plan things and if I do plan them they never come out like I plan them so they always come out as something as something else I never write things and think oh I want to write something that I think Jared could sing on or I can or I think oh he could talk I just write something and, you know, oh do you know what I'll just spray it this is normally how it works would you agree Jared I write stuff and I go done this done this today what do you think of that a couple of occasions we've sat down me here and him there and we've done we've, we've written from start to finish on the day i mean 
production wise obviously not um, but we've yeah. sat down and I've started with a beat and he's gone oh yeah dude I've got this and then well I think what basically happens is I sit I hear him mumbling and reading stuff off his phone and thing and I sit there going oh my god he's getting worse together I need to do something else and I'm just throwing beats on and this and this and this until we get to a point, and I'm not sure whether we're both doing the same thing, look at each other going, shit, he's doing this now, I've got to do this. He's nearly finished, he's got an extra verse. Oh, no, I've got... yep. uh, but yep. We've done a couple of skin job. we did exactly like that. Sat here yep. one, one afternoon in two or three hours and, and skin job came out. So we don't plan, I don't plan things. I have a style of, of creating music, mostly because I'm a drummer. It comes from the rhythm tracks. I like. I just like different. I like noises and things and stuff. Mm hmm. And throwing in all this unexpected stuff, you know, chance operation is a huge factor. Allowing the mistakes to actually become integral aspects. Yeah. Bizarre sounds and playing with effects and tweaking certain things, and you stumble across something, and that unexpected aspect, you have to be really open to, and I've, I've worked with quite a few musicians who haven't been able to get beyond the little box, um, to get beyond their sort of preordained script of how a song is supposed to work, and what its outcome is going to be, and what its impact will be, and, and how it should be approached and all the different aspects that need to work together to fit into it to make it happen anyone that knows me knows that i am absolutely an engine of chaos martin's approach is great because he's completely open to oh, what the fuck was that oh let's pull that in and, and then we'll get it down here attenuate it a little bit and we'll chop it up there and and i'm you know yeah as he said when we were working on skin job i kept looking up and going oh this is really exciting it's really exciting holy fuck he's got a whole song done god damn it i've got to get some more words together and so we're sort of inspiring and inciting each other and and that's really what it's like all the time again it's a very organic process lots of i don't know just playful goofy give and take and not taking it too fucking seriously so you guys uh, actually build this mythical woods and then you just go find these creatures within it you just go walking around in these woods you made and, and there they are the, uh, a lot of that comes from the order that we put them together in i think they, those that, that album could have been put in a different order and it wouldn't have felt like that it's only because shadowlands was such a obvious it, it just went it just came along and went i'm i'm starting this album and from here you can make your story and it was a mm. it was such a dominant first track the, the oh, it's the table setter. It's the table setter. And it's hilarious that it's the table setter because it's this, it's this sad, damp, windy little track with the crows blown through the clouds in the background. It's not how you start a record off. No. You want to start it off with, you know, this, or you want to start off with this, or you want to start off with, mm, you know. And no, instead, it's, it's sort of, it's distant and, and turned from the side, looking at you just sort of over its shoulder as you're blown out of the frame. And it does, it really sets the tone. It really sets the tone. And that's, it's an interesting thing to talk about the sequencing because a lot of, I think a lot of why Martin and I work so well together is because we're old and a lot of stuff is unspoken. There's a lot of life experience there, but also things like the sequencing actually matters. He and I both yeah. grew up with records where you'd put the needle on side A, and it would take you on a thematic, intellectual, creatively athletic journey. It would have peaks and valleys, and by the end of side A, you were on tenterhooks, and you'd flip it over, and it would take you somewhere else, and it became this whole arc, so that by the last track on side B, you'd be landed somewhere satisfying and fully engorged with the story of this, this record. That's beautiful and dead on true. Well, with that, with you guys working together and Martin, the other people that you're working with, how much are you acting as a cheerleader in this process and how do you do that to get what you want in the track? Uh, right, okay, so there's only one other person and that's Bob, Roberto. Yeah. Bob and I, Bob, I mean, in terms of uh, the UK versus America, Bob, 
I could spit out the window into Bob's front room. He's about 30 <laughs> miles from me, but we only see each other once every couple of weeks. We like to do mixing here together because it's very difficult to, for him to be doing a track and sending it here and going, what do you think of this? On you. We've done a couple of remixes in the last four weeks and it's been quite difficult for he sent, you know, for someone to send you saying, go, well, what do you think of this? And I have to phone him up, you know, and go, right, this, this, and this, and this. This is how it works here. Bob writes stuff. I write stuff. We almost never write stuff together, but we sometimes finish each other's stuff. That's how New Cold War is, is a Bob track. Bob has his style that he writes in, and when he sent that... Uh, I was like, okay, what that really needs is a big kick-ass bass drum, kick drum in it, and some little drum and bassy flicky tickety <laughs> stuff. And then when it comes to the mix down, this it works very much like this. Bob, he'll he'll sit here alongside me and he'll go, oh yeah. See, and I'll be saying, yeah, I don't know what it is about this area of the track, a bit woolly and this. And Bob says, oh yeah, well that's because. And then he starts to talk technical. I glaze over. And then he pulls up the EQ things and stuff, and he sits down, he's like, da, 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 da. and we're listening to the bass line over and over again. I'm sat there getting more and more bored. So then I go, Bob, I'm just going to take the dogs out. I go out for half an hour, come back, and he goes, yeah, I'm done. And I sit there, and he plays it, and I just say, that's amazing. Like, what did you do? And then, but even and even when he solos the bass or whatever it is, I still can't hear what it is he's done. But when he puts it all back into the track, I'm like, that's... you." It's, it's fixed. So Bob does a lot of the stuff. He spring, he does that. I, I mean, I, I think I probably write about 80% of the stuff. Probably that's fair. Um, Bob, are you going to see this, Bob? Mm, will he see this? I don't know. I'll, I'll say 70. But the stuff that Bob does, Bob's just done a remix for Sia, which he did because we couldn't work together. He's done, he did all on his own. In his own way, and it is absolutely knockout. And all that I might have been one of the most relatable things I've heard in a long time is just that glazed look when the technical talk starts. <laughs> that's, well, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> that, I mean that's it for me. I don't have any of that. These oh. I've got my ears, and that's I think how we don't. He, Jared doesn't have to see much. We do boring shit for hours on end. You know, it's like oh, we. I, I don't think is this does this fit. Does this bit of vocal? How do we move it? And we just keep moving shit. About and I go, oh, I think it's in the right place. That's how we work. There's no. Colin, I don't give a shit. Just make it sound good. <laughs> yeah. I, I relate 100%. I'm very used to seeing that completely glazed over. I just want to be somewhere else. Look, what? Because I nerd out a little hard. I'm aware. That never bothers me, and I like sitting around, and I liked it, you know, when Dylan was programming Chem Lab stuff, we'd drop some vocals, and he'd work on fitting it all in, and he and I would work on the arrangement, and then he'd go in and do all the fine tuning, the Rococo crafting of detail. He would keep looking over and saying, as Martin does periodically, oh, I'm sorry, man, this is really boring. And actually for me, as long as it's okay that I disengage from the process, I like hearing the song and I'll continue to write and pull ideas together because I'm, you know, I'm no tech head. I'm fairly able to drive a pen then I can do things like my, my capacity for turning on and off lights is pretty well honed at almost 60 years. So, you know, technology and I have a friendly relationship, but, you know. This does lead into a question I had for you, Jared, in you have some of the most fantastic shoes I've seen in general. <laughs> well, thank you. An amazing style overall, but have you found that your footwear changes the tone in the studio? Do you, do you feel like there's more, more snap to a track with a zebra print or more of a nevish tone with the alligator skin? Or I think that the shoes accentuate where I am that day. There are certain shoes that do not aid the process of good vocal recording. I've got a kick-ass pair of pink snakeskin shoes with a awesome point on them. And though they are fantastic and I adore them, I don't get good vocal recordings when I'm wearing them. And I don't know if it's because they're not quite as cushiony as I need or if I'm worried that they're going to squeak a little bit, but no shit. I 
I try not to wear them when I'm recording something that I'm really passionate about because they're going to fucking throw me off. Whereas a good pair of leather black and whites, forget about it. I'm in like Flynn. I feel now, this is I fucking feel, journalism. Like I that feel, is a true secret revealed right there. God damn. I feel totally, totally vindicated now because we had new carpets put for our whole house. Jared was one of the first people coming around and Penn's like, most people come around, it's like shoes are off and blah, blah, blah. I just went, there's absolutely no way I'm going to get him to take those off because he won't be able to sing as well without his shoes <laughs> on. And oh, I was right. I didn't know I was right, but I was fucking right. You were, you were, you were, you are absolutely vindicated. I can't record vocals in bare feet or socks. Do it. Marcus, do it. love you <laughs> Yeah, but how you do uh, no shoes thing on stage or in the studio? Forget about it. No way. Yeah, no. Uh -uh. It, it makes absolute sense. I've seen Bob here when Bob's sitting there next to me in his socks, and I've seen him look and you go, "Hey, he's got his fucking shoes on. I'm in socks. How's that work?" That's how it works, Bob. Wow, I'm rethinking everything. It's yep, there you go. The interview that completely turned your world upside Boom. down everything about this made sense and it's it's <laughs> it's about it's about what i pictured here so glad there you go so I, the short answer is yes excellent not that long ago i was listening back to some sal records and megley chin and then dog tablet came out i was really surprised hearing a lot of very signature sounds realizing oh that was that was you on those albums because you have something that's so you in yes, what you do sonically at the same time listening to dog tablet i'm it has much more of an organic human feel and i'm if that's intentional if that's just sign of the times and technology changing or What's going on with that? Uh, I think it's a bit of both, really, because in the, the last, uh, I think on the Fermas album, I, I played more drums. You know, I don't sit and play drum tracks, but I am going to play a drum track. But I do play a lot of the rhythms that I feed into the MIDI and then run through tons of different things to see which sound sounds the best. So there's a basic difference. So the different, there's a difference between the way I write and the way Bob writes. Bob writes and he literally mixes as, as he goes sort of thing. Whereas when I, when I write, I, I, by, the time, by the time I put a piece together, there generally isn't any mixing needs done because I only use the sounds that, because I don't really know much about mixing, I only use the sounds and uh, everything that, that fits for them. I've got a really short uh, attention span and things need to happen very quickly or I get really bored with them. So if something's not working, I, I, I don't mess about trying to fix it, throw it out, put a new thing. It doesn't surprise me that my stuff sounds like it's mine. A lot of that's to do with the with the accessibility of the sounds because i love those organic sounding sounds whereas you know like 10 15 years ago that yeah there's keyboard and there's some loops that's pretty much where you are but now i got lovely library of different instruments and stuff to use and i do prefer the organic -y type things i will use a live drum sound if i can over a processed one but mostly uh, my trade secret is most of my tracks have two or three electronic loops on them and two or three played organic loops and you would be amazed at how much drums there is on all my tracks you can't hear them all they don't all but they all do something in their place there's definitely a lot of and the more i listen to it the more i hear movement there's like a sound stage. There's you keep listening and you hear these things moving far in the back yeah. that keep things moving. That's really interesting. Which also, so the track "Safe House" was that you singing as well? Yeah. Okay. That had such a different feel to me than a lot of the other tracks on that. But the bass was that an actual like stand up fretless bass on that, or is that samples, or what was going on there? Uh, it's a Native Instruments double bass. Uh, damn it! They've come so far. I'm useless now. I mean, it's an amazing. I've used that. I've used that bass sound on so many 
well not so many but lots of tra it's a beautiful beautiful sound and depending on how you play it on your keyboard it feels real and i said to bob oh, oh, can you write a bass line for this this is what i've got and then he writes he sent me an email back and then to say you take the piss this is a perfect <laughs> bass line so yeah and that, it's a lovely lovely sound that part of the reason is the way that martin plays he's deft he's got a light touch and he doesn't play too much he's not trying to prove a point with his playing he's just accentuating aspects of the song he's laying down a, a piece of muscle that needs to be there but not trying to not trying to make a point with it this is just what the song needs and because his playing is so deft and easy it makes it sound like a stand-up bass and it isn't it was amazing. I want to just circle back to something a little bit more simple and find out why you chose the name Dog Tablet. Is that your dog on the cover of the first album? Uh, yes, on the right. So second question first. For that, the do uh, on the first album, that's Connie. He's downstairs. The collar on the second album, Double Thirty, is the collar of Dexter, the dog that we that came to us at four years old and died six months later of cancer. And his racing name was Double Thirty, and that's why the album's called Double Thirty, and it has his collar on the, on the front. Why are we called Dog Tablet? I'd love to tell you it's a really great thing, and there's no way of making this sound exciting, I've got to tell you. In the 70s and the 80s in the UK, there was a company that made all pet products for worming, etc. Like anything that was wrong with your dog, this, there's one particular company that made them all and they were called Bob Martin, okay? We were sitting in the pub with some friends. We were like, we need to get a name for this thing. And someone went, well, I don't know, Bob, mine, what are you doing? We we're like, oh, Bob, mine, Bob, mine. Oh, dog, oh, tablets, dog, dog, dog tablet. And that's dog tablet. Yeah, as soon as you said Bob Martin together, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> But it's sort of uh, symbolic of so much of the music, too. It's just wandering, wandering into something as opposed to pointing towards it and going that way. Yeah. I like that. So we kind of dived into how technology has made certain aspects of the industry easier. How have things gotten easier over time since you've been involved in the scene so long? And how have things gotten more difficult now that so many people are able to write and record things on their own? It makes a huge difference, the advent of technology, because I can live over in England and still write a chem lab record with the guys in Chicago. We wrote the Prude record that we did. Mark Plastic and I have worked together for years. He lives in London. I live an hour away down south in Lewis. Matt Fennell from Caustic and Clack, you know, he's in uh, Milwaukee and then Phil was in Chicago and then Howie Benno from Revolting Cox and Chicago Tracks and Ministry. He was in New York, you know, and yet we managed to write this whole record. So the technology is a huge boon. It's a huge boon. And it allows me to do what I'm going to start doing finally this week to record vocals here at home on new dog tablet stuff and bounce it over to Martin and he can say, wow, that's completely unexpected. Some of that shit, some of this is good. And I don't have to keep storing these ideas in my head or seeing them into my phone, though that's uh, technology advent as well. By the same token, you know, the absorption of uh, smaller labels by larger ones, the whole industry has completely changed. Everybody can put out records. And just because you can release a record doesn't mean that you should. And so it becomes a signal to noise ratio issue. It's very hard to find stuff that's interesting. It's hard to just break through the chatter. It makes promotion for artists both easier and harder. I think at the end of the day, it's an incredibly useful tool. And finding the balance, a record label, for example, working with Armalite for the ChemLab stuff, then the technology becomes a, a buttressing and enforcing aspect that allows everything to do better and amplifies all of it. Whereas when you're on your own, 
you can you can get so far, but then you get caught in the whole mesh of signal and noise. But at least you can get that far. Whereas when you were before technology came along, man, mailing out records and calling up college radio stations and you know getting CMJ to play things and putting videos on the Rock America compilations and what a fucking nightmare. So I'm glad a bunch of that is made easier. But you know everything everything's a double bladed sword. Even double bladed swords are double bladed swords. What do you think, Martin? I think exactly what you said, actually. Word, word, word. <laughs> well, good. I think, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm really lucky to be in a place where I'm making music for the, for the sake of making music because I enjoy doing it. And because if, Fuck yeah. if I didn't, I wouldn't have anything to do. I mean, I wouldn't. I don't have any other hobbies. I can't cook all day long, 24 hours a day. I can't drink 24 hours a day. I can't watch football 24 hours. I can't watch football at all at the moment. Oh, sorry, soccer. But music I can do 24 hours a day. I can do it from the moment I fancy doing it to the moment I don't fancy doing it. Actually, Martin, real quick, I want to jump in. And this might turn this interview really, really awkward. I didn't think about this. I'm one of the few Americans that pretty strongly follows British Premier League soccer. It's all going to go very badly wrong now. I'm scared. What team do you follow, sir? Oh, shit. Here we go. Oh, you're grabbing memorabilia. This oh, is this pretty is, serious. <laughs> this is intense. This yeah, that's what I was worried about. Okay, um, interview <laughs> over. Uh, get bent. Um, it was nice knowing you. I'm glad we had this relationship up until now. Chelsea football rules. Blue is the color. And Godspeed. That's fine. My, my, my recently departed father was a Chelsea fan. I used to feel guilty because every day I'd say, every time there was a game on, I'd say, I hope you don't win. <laughs> and that's how and that's how it went and then I, I used to think there was a point I was thinking you should probably stop saying that at some point because it would you know but it's like nah sorry dad I hope you don't win I, I was fair. brought up by a Chelsea fan my sister's a Chelsea fan they sound like great people what happened to you well obviously I went down the right road <laughs> yeah left everybody else behind yeah yeah when oh. I normally do my own thing okay we were, I'm sorry let's get back to music back to music yeah. all right well, really quickly, we can tie those two things together. You won't be surprised to learn that I can do that. We were asked to do, or I was asked to do, or you and I, Martin, were asked to do a Dead Kennedys cover for compilation yeah, yeah, yeah. that Atkins was doing. So I picked Chemical Warfare. Well, the first line of the song is, down at the arsenal where they keep the nerve gases. So I dropped that down and Martin stopped us right there. And he said, down at the arsenal where they keep the nerve gases. I'm sorry, you can't fucking sing that. <laughs> uh, what? Uh, I'd been in England for about a year. Football was still, you know, it's like an American thing. I mean, I knew about English football and I, you know, it's fine. It's not baseball. I don't give a motherfuck. So it's uh, down at the arsenal where they keep the nerve. You don't like nerve gases? The song's called Chemical Warfare. What's the problem? I mean, that's, it's the nature of the beast here. I can't sing about, no, 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 no. It's not that. You can't say the word arsenal in my studio. <laughs> in what? I can't say arsenal. Oh, oh, there's. He said, no, I fucking hate Arsenal. You mean where they keep the nerve gas? It's like, no, the fucking football team. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, <laughs> okay. Glad that, glad so I that. went and, you know, I forget what the fix was, but if you go and listen to it, I'm seeing <laughs> something else, but not Arsenal. Down at the, ar I think I said so army scary. base. <laughs> wow. So that, so that we could get in something that sounded like Arsenal, but wasn't Arsenal because fuck me, you know, Martin's bigger and taller than I am. And just being a little wisp of a girl, he would have laid me flat. So, oh. you know, I think it was down that at the army amazing. base where they keep the nerve gases. I was now, laughing. Now that you tell the story, I can sort of remember that. It was kind of <laughs> those were, those were not. That was at the uh, fortress, I think. Yeah, oh so, yeah, it was. Oh yeah, Jared it was, was back talking about in the your old studio, in the yeah. Subgenius studio. Jared was talking about the fortress before. Um, in it was, the fortress was amazing. There were there were so many bands. I mean, it was a small building, but not that small. Uh, Raymond 
pick Raymond. No, it's a fucking huge complex. Yeah, it was. But, well, it's not huge. I don't think oh, by American standards it's huge. Three, four, three, four three floors. floors of yeah. studios galore. Downstairs, oh, yeah. there was a bar, a little restaurant oh, thing, and then a whole Patty's, dance floor. Patty's Bar and Grill. Yeah. Downstairs. Uh, but Peak, uh, Raymond Peak was five doors up from us. Collapsed Lung were next door and Swerve Driver were underneath us, I think. Mark Heal was in and out of the studio all the time yeah. because he was working with Raymond Watts a bunch. Uh, and then you remember I brought my friend Brian Black, who was in the band Halo Black, yeah. that I signed to Fifth Column back in the 90s. And then he was part of Hellbent. And then he started doing, because I brought him down to Fortress. He was like, oh, 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 all these cool people are here. Fuck me. I want to hang out. And so he hung out in his studio with Mark Heal. And you remember that drunken idiot French guy, uh, Olivier? Well, he and Olivier started this band. Because Olivier was actually a friend of mine. I had also introduced him to the Fortress. And he and this other French looney tune named Eric with this huge scorpion tattoo on his chest. Wonderful guy. No longer whinnying with us, unfortunately. But um, the and three of us had been in a possible band for a little while. So and I brought them down to Fortress. And then Brian went on and did some stuff with Raymond, with Pig, and uh, Side Project, and helped set up the Six City website. And then uh, Brian is doing uh, Black Asteroid now, the techno project, and DJing loads. So yeah, it was, uh, oh, it was a fun place. And Martin's yeah. studio was there, so I'd go down and hang out with him a bunch. And, and then go and, you know, he'd be writing, and I'd be like, I'm, I'm gonna go and dance for a couple of hours. Like, yeah, whatever, I'm busy making noises here. And, it was great. It was a really, uh, it was a yeah. fun time. Oh, wow. I, I could just hear about that all day, but all right, I'm going to, I'm going to be a professional. I'm going to try and bring it back around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're a journalist. I'm a fucking yeah, journalist. Yeah, baby. All right. On track nine on Feathers and Skin, it's called Collapsing Lives. I really, really love this one. And another thing about kind of the modern scene and like you guys have talked to is through the Joy Thieves and through you guys, I, I'm meeting other people in kind of this web of connections. So I got talking to uh, Safira V, who does the vocals there. I, I love getting a chance for you guys to kind of promote somebody new and talk about it. Tell me a little bit about what it was like working with her and what you felt she was able to bring to that track. There's a new world, which being quite old, you have to be involved in the online world, t Twitter. Uh, which, so sometimes there are days when you don't fancy doing music. So you have to do the online presence and I find it really fucking tedious. But sure. it has to be done. You know, it's, you've got to do it, you've got to sit there and you go, go through your Twitter thing. I can't remember what, how it was, but I met Sophia on Twitter. I was just, I was listening to something that she'd done and I, I asked her to send me some stems so I could play with them and stuff and I was doing that. And then I thought, why, why am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why don't I just ask her to do some to record some vocals? So I sent yeah. her. I think I sent her three or four tracks and said, "Would you like to pick one of these to do some vocals on?" And she did. She chose that track. She recorded the vocals and sent them back to me. I put them in the track. And yeah, it, there's nothing complicated about our connections anymore. And that's how. And it, and then through her, I met Melody Hall. Uh, I love. I, I yeah, keep yeah. hearing more and more, and it, great remixes too. Yeah, yeah. We do have a new project on the go. M uh, Melody Hall's done vocals for us. On, on a track this time. We use, so remember the, the Outlaws album is uh, instrumental. So we've given some of the original instrumental tracks to different vocalists and said, put some vocals on them and we'll rework, we'll rework the tracks with vocals. So which we're going to, which we're working on for a new project that we're doing now. And he's doing one of those. He's taken the track, I think he took a track from the Double 30 album, actually. Uh, did he? No, he didn't. He took a track from the Outlaws album. Jared's done two tracks from the Outlaws album, which he's put words to and vocals. So the idea is not not just to get the vocals and stick them over the top of the original and go, da-da. It's yeah. get, get the, the vocalist's impression of what they want to do and then re rework the track around the vocals. 
it's fun having vocals on, on tracks, especially from when you didn't write them with the intention of having anything on them. Then you have to fight yourself because it, some of those instrumentals I love and I listen to them and I think I listen to them different to other people. There are certain points to them which I, I look forward to happening. I go, oh, here it comes, here it comes. And then someone goes, right, here's my vocals. I would like to do this. And you go, oh, fuck. But that's right over that beautiful little, and you, okay, it's got to go and out it goes well i was gonna say with that do you try to find ways to sneak those elements yes, back so in of course i do <laughs> good and, and that's yeah, cool. i think the I vocals think have in. to be really quiet in this segment <laughs> we just you know we're gonna put sort of a, you know a shimmery effect on the vocals and we're gonna turn them way down right around here for the next minute and a half <laughs> just Actually, just shut up here. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's normally I'll just either add eight bars in somewhere else and bring them in there because I, I want to hear them. But there have been times where I've just left them out completely. Yeah, yeah, that one always exists. But those moments are really important, I think. Those in many songs that I'm absolutely in love with that are deeply rooted inside of me, there are these little moments, that sonic moments, that yeah. uh, really make the song there's a great bit of feedback in Turn Blue that is just, it's perfect to me and it's completely unintended and it makes the song and they just left it in because, you know, it was Iggy and Bowie and they were making this record and they really didn't yeah. fucking care. I look forward to it every time and the idea of there being suddenly vocals on top of this thing that, that makes the song actually alive and interesting and engaging and challenging would just kill me. So I respect your ability to just leave stuff out. One of the things I respect one of the many things I respect about Jared is that when, when I'm sitting here and he's behind that wall, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I think he shouldn't sing that much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell him. I'm going to tell him. And we've done this a couple of times. I've gone, you, there are too many vocals in here. There's too, you, there's too much, too much words. It's too much words. Is that even English? There's too much words. It, it is it's now, too, but no. <laughs> Made there's sense. too much words. The, you know, and he's really, he's always really cool with that. He's never stormed away anyway, so. Nah, I haven't yet. Uh, the words are all really important. They all really matter, but there are lots of different ways to say them. And That's there are exactly. lots of different ways to approach the topic. One of the things that I have a great problem with, as anybody knows who follows me on Farcebook or used to follow me on Twitter or on Instagram or the Patreon account, knows that I have serious verbal diarrhea. I love the sound of my own typing. I can, you know, I can type Olympically, type for, for the country. One of the things that has really, Martin's writing has engendered in me is a willingness to edit. My wife is an editor and she edits not for word count, but for um, content strength and for um, conceptual muscularity. So over 20 years, I've learned one, perhaps two things from her because I'm a stubborn, bullheaded motherfucker. <laughs> she leans in and goes, yeah, you are. Yes, I know. I love you too. And editing is a, it's a really important skill. Uh, I have run a lot of creative writing and creative thinking workshops in schools and high schools and universities and with teenagers in prison and kids in hospital and beds, helping them to better command the language. And one of the most important tools is the ability to sharpen a blade and then use it acutely. I try and apply it more and more with my writing because Martin's writing, it's, it's subtle and there's a certain complexity to it without having to apply lots of detail and all these little bits and pieces. It requires less from me. And that's a skill that at almost 60 years, I'm only just beginning to learn. But it, it works. It requires that I think about a different avenue and a different way to approach saying this. And instead of saying it like that, I can say it like this or like that. Although I'm precious about the idea and the emotional impact of what I want to convey, I'm not necessarily always precious about the way that it's done. I'm always happy to hear the input. You know, I can always call him a motherfucking uptight bitch when I'm on the train home, so shit.
I, I was curious with your vocals and your lyrics, you have this intense, like I get a lot of the beat poets coming through you and that inspiration. So lyrically, is that something intentionally thought about? Is that just the way you think and deliver? Do you actually talk like that consistently? I talk like me consistently, which is uh, this whole car crash of, Lots of different things. I uh, The books aren't just for display, so I have absorbed a great deal of literature. It leaks out, and I push some of it in because, you know, I don't care about being called pretentious. I'm an old man. I, you know, I'm used to that one by now. Beat poets, sure. I have always loved their writing, and I got to spend a number of years uh, hanging out with and taking care of Herbert Hunky, who is the lost beat of the beat generation. He's the one living on Times Square as uh, this gutter saint hustler that all of those guys discovered and wanted to be like. Burroughs wished that he had been Hunky and Ginsburg and Carl Sandburg. They all wished that they were Herbert. He's the one who coined the term, in fact. And I got to hang out with him a bunch, so I'm sure that he fed into my brain. But it's, you know, it's a collection of all kinds of stuff jg ballard mm. cannot be ignored he's very present as well i try not to let any of it become really blatant because that's just too fucking easy i may be old but i'm not lazy well at least not all the time but i i appreciate the compliment do i talk like that all the time i don't know you've been you've been in okay, an well, interview with me for an hour to... now so then you would have to answer that question yourself turn it around and well is this cat full of it or you know is uh, is this how he actually is i don't know so let me tell you that at christmas when uh, bob's wife kelly met jared for the first time after jared had gone and i was chatting to kelly and she said what a you, fucking jerk off. God, am I glad he's out of here. Jesus. Oh my God, you heard. God <laughs> never fucking shuts up. <laughs> she said that when you have a conversation with Jared, it's like, it's like suddenly you're in a book. That's what she said. It's like suddenly you're in a book and you just get sucked into whatever he's saying and you can't. It's, I think that, and that's fair enough. I think that's a fair assessment of that what i can't work out whether he looks pissed off about that or not <laughs> oh no i was waiting for you to say it and you can't get him to shut up <laughs> that's always my joke with people who want an interview you know they always ask hey man can i get an interview with you and i tell them you're asking the wrong question that's, that's not the question you should be asking. Of course, a guy like me, TLDR himself, you know, uh, yeah, you can get an interview. The question you should be asking is, can you get me to fucking stop? <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy when I'm reading your longer posts, especially though, the fact that I can't help but hear them in your voice from the recordings because the way uh, you write has this pacing and this delivery that is very in tune with your vocals. I'm glad that, yes, uh, my voice is able to actually dovetail and present itself. That's a good thing. I like that. I like that. Would you believe it? I've, I, in the past, I don't know, three weeks, I've been told twice, possibly three times, TLDR. It's like, are you fucking high? You're coming to a writer's page and you're going to tell him too long, didn't read? Excuse me, but, you know. Oh, I didn't know that's what, I was trying to work out what that meant. So Ed, Ed Finkler of Dead Agent, who we've reviewed and I'm a big fan of, he was on our compilation as well, The Tiny Gods. I know he got you to get started on Patreon, you know, kind of talked with you about it, and then you started this Patreon page. And I've been enjoying the shit out of it. I mean, it's really interesting to me to hear, see both the pictures, hear old stories you put in it, your poetry, other tracks. And, and this is kind of a new thing that I'm seeing a lot of different artists get into. I wondered if you'd tell me a little bit about what your experience has been on it and maybe what people interested in joining your Patreon, what kind of things you might be putting on there in the future for people to be excited about. 
I I love it. It allows me to do what I naturally do, which is to go. Bleh. I do enjoy the sound of my own typing. I, I think I'm I, I'm a complete and irredeemable fool, but sometimes the fool makes for laughable comedy on the town square. Um, and occasionally, by chance operation, says something perhaps that has a grain of uh, interest and truth in it. Um, it allows me to write and not have to worry about editing. I mean, I do. I edit all of them quite intensely, but I don't edit them to minimize in the way that I have to with a song. I, I edit them for content and, again, for muscularity, but it allows room to spread out. Because I worry that, you know, on Facebook or certainly on Instagram, I'm squeezed into this tiny little box that really isn't comfortable for me. And I make it work. But oh, my God, it's uh, it's been a real pleasure. And I'm beginning to just throw things at it. I threw this interview, the gauntlet interview, Martin, a couple of months ago for Dog Tablet. Um, I just threw that up there because I don't think that the PR guy uh, actually ever used it and it has some comical moments to it. It allows me to expose people to a whole host of photographs that I've got. I'm going to start putting artwork up there as well. It also allows people to get in on things ahead of everybody else. I'm about to open up a chem lab t-shirt and art spot where people can get shirts and merchandise and stuff and anyone that's part of the patreon platform gets to have all that stuff you know with a 10 15 percent discount they that's get me. to hear things in advance yay there you go and the chem lab records that are coming out have got uh, demo tracks attached to them now. Not on the CD because I can't stand the idea that you're going to cram a bunch of extra stuff onto that disc. It'll be separate discs. The vinyl will be separate as well because the original thing needs to be the original thing. It needs to retain the essence of what it was to begin with. But those demo tracks, they're cassette demos. And so I'm going to throw some of them up onto the Patreon platform so that people can listen to them there long before it comes out on vinyl. And some of them won't ever come out on vinyl. The only place you'll be able to listen to will be there. I don't know. I like it. It's also, it's a good place for me to bounce ideas and stretch things out and people are unreasonably indulgent of me. I'm honored and humbled by the fact that people are still interested in anything that I have to say at this stage of the game. It's incredible hubris to break a band up and then six years later say, hey, hey I'm back. Everybody's still interested? Yeah, because I'm going to rock you down to the ground and then build it up and then tear it down again. We're going to go. And everyone's like, huh? Oh, the, yeah, cool. That's great, man. What was you talking about? You know, nobody gives a fuck. Surprisingly, 11 people do give a fuck. And that's, I'm shocked and grateful. And so I try to treat it with great respect, but I, you know, I don't know. I'm lucky. No, that's, lucky. that's a great answer. And I, I, I think it's just what you said. It's really nice that, I, look, you're going to have fans that are enjoying your music and enjoy what you do and like to shake that ass to it or whatever. But then there are fans that are on another level from that and people who are genuinely interested in delving deeper to a particular band, maybe. When you have those people and have a platform to offer something extra. And in this day and age, you know, with the internet and everything you do, you have access to artists in a different way beyond just their music. I love the fact that it gives that. And I think you're one of the ones I follow. Stephen Archer is one that I subscribe to. I think there's a few people like that that really have made great use of that platform to offer another level of experience to those who are interested in engaging with it. And, and I hope that that's something that really grows and becomes a thing for the future. I mean, you're going to have a lot of bands that you love and music that you listen to, and I have pretty wide tastes, but there are certain bands that maybe you want to dive deeper on. I, I love that it gives that chance. And I think having that, that access is such a privilege, you know, yeah. I, I would, 
have loved to be able to engage in a deeper exploration of the brain of someone like Roland Howard or, you know, Alexander Hacke. Just the way that they approach music and art and literature is fascinating. Roland Howard, unfortunately, is gone, so we won't ever get that opportunity. But, you know, if Hacke were to do something like that, uh, you know, I don't follow anyone on Patreon. Bing, well, there I'd be. I'd be hooked, you know. Uh, it's great. Because you get to see behind the curtain and, and you get to see the humanity of the person and the vulnerability yes. of the person. You know, I posted something the other day about Coil and how yeah. you know, I, was, I was that close to talking to Peter Christofferson about making a, a video for us. And, you know, oh, oh, yes, but oh, look, shiny, shiny, and it's a bag of dope. And, you know, it, it was this vulnerable moment for me but it felt okay to talk about because it's, uh, I don't know, it's people. safe, respectful. It's people who want to be involved. Respectful community. Yeah. Yeah. And, think, and maybe, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it's one of those things where there are a number of artists where the process is evidently extremely important to the end product and understanding that. The process is part of the art. And I feel with you guys i definitely get that impression and that makes me want more i want to understand more about what it is i'm hearing and experiencing and this this platform gives people the ability to experience this not just as a product but as a, a performance and as a piece and something bigger Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and there's so much that goes into making whatever the art is you know i've I, I keep wanting in interviews like this to, you know, pick the phone up and then go and look over at the table over there because that's where I build a lot of the burnout books and all the materials yeah. and the different stuff. And I've thought about doing, you know, doing a video as I'm working on one of the books. Seeing behind the curtain is incredibly engaging and I think as a culture we really enjoy that that's why biographies and autobiographies are so popular because we get to see behind that's why the West Wing not only because it was Aaron Sorkin but you know seeing behind the curtain like that and seeing the real life is incredibly engaging and I think that there's all kinds of stuff that artists can convey that we don't have the opportunity to do. I, I can't do it when, when, you know, I'm covered in paint and glitter and fucking feathers and, you know, and I'm rolling around on the floor at, at Metro. You know, I spent so many years as a complete, complete implosion, this heroin addict junky fuck up scumbag fuck face asshole yet i had this innate ability to make looking like an i made being a junkie look cool which is this awful burden that i will carry forever and people are dead because of it and i almost died because of it twice and I led people astray because I was happily astray and learned all the wrong lessons from the right people. You know, um, I didn't learn about high art from Bowie. I learned about getting high. I didn't learn about, you know, in the 20 plus years that I've been clean, I feel like it's my sociocultural responsibility to try and make being a clean musician, a clean artist, a good husband and loving dad. If I still have any influence, I have to redress the balance for, you know, people like Karen and, and you know, Bobby Ross and Craig Albertson and all these people who stand behind me all the time and who aren't here uh, largely because of me. So maybe through something like Patreon, I can actually reach out to someone that is wrestling with something like that and they can reach out as well and say, yeah, I feel that, I understand that, that makes sense. And maybe help out, I don't know. No, that's, that's awesome. And, and 
I feel that and I agree a hundred percent, you know, the, the things that, that you did in the past, like you said, to make them look cool, you can make this just as engaging and just as cool. And I, I think it's important to do that. Um, so no, I really appreciate it. You have been on some incredible tours in your career. Do you have any fun tales from the tour bus? <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> Yes, I have one, I think, maybe two. There are, there are loads and loads and loads and loads of them because to me, life is about collecting interesting stories and then being able to tell them engagingly. So I guess I'm alive. One always leads into another. And I was thinking about telling the whole curse saga. Yes, because that's a friend of mine, too. We love Curse. We've interviewed him, too. I'd love to hear this story. We do, indeed. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. Yeah. And I, I was so pleased to, to hear his new album. Be I'm, always, I'm always excited okay. by Friends' new records, but I'm always a little bit leery as well, because, you know, if it... It always asks the question, now that you're putting this record on, how much are you going to have to lie to the person? And fortunately, with that one, I didn't have to lie to him at all. It was just, it's yeah. gorgeous and dark so and talk good. about poisonous confection. Actually, I was, and I'll tell that story at some point. I was just, I was talking to a friend of mine, actually, on Patreon about the first tour that we were on, because this guy actually saw the first show of that Nine Inch Nails tour, which was just such a, such a shock for us. I mean, complete culture shock, jaw-dropping shift from everything that I had done. And it was Dylan's first tour, and we were a dog, our first show on that tour. And Trent got in touch with me because I've known him on and off for years. And certainly during that period, we knew each other reasonably well, because I've I met him on his first tour and he played the club that I used to run in DC during the eighties and you know, blah, 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 blah. There's a whole bunch of stories there too. So he called me up and said, do you want to come out and support us on the second half of the now I'm nothing tours 90. And we had just put out that first EP and nobody knew who we were. And so it was a, this huge favor to us and D Warsaw were the main support band. I was like, Fuck yeah. He said, do you awesome. want to come along? It's like, oh yeah, ow, ow, twist my butt. <laughs> yes, of course I do. Thank you so much. He said, y you know, we can give you a hundred bucks a night and come along and, you know, come do half a dozen shows. Like, fuck yeah, this is great. And that first show, we had done one show before that and it was on a track band night at this weird little museum nightclub that was so, you know, Vogue and she, she in New York. And we absolutely didn't fit in. And so to, to be on this tour was just perfect. It was lovely as literature. And that first show at the, the boat house in Richmond, we got on stage and there's 4,000 people there. And, you know, it's there. They've got tour buses galore and gear and mountains of shit. And, and we pull up in our little van with, you know, a guitar and an amp and this rattle trap drum kit. And, and we're just completely ghetto and Vietnam. Like, here we are. They threw us up on stage and I, had spent the sound check getting this bare bulb in uh you know in a plastic cage like you see on construction sites and i didn't really like the cage but i wanted the the lighting for the stage to be like in a world war ii bunker where you've got the bulbs swinging back and yeah, forth and the yeah. shadows sweeping across the stage and i thought fuck this would look so great so we you know i got it all hanging beautifully and first song reach out and push the bulb and it swings back and forth and and i'm thinking oh this is so good and we're playing filament and so i grab it again and i swing it and it goes side to side and those shadows sweeping all over is really engaging and i'm not really paying attention to anything except how awesome the light looks and this huge fucking crowd my god four thousand people what am i doing here we're just a sham talk about emperor's new clothes and pretenders to the throne and so i grab 
grab the light bulb again. We're coming up to the first chorus and I take it and I swing it out and the light bulb goes smash on the ceiling. And then there's just this rain of glass and the stage awash in nothing but darkness. And the band is raging along and I can't see a fucking thing. There are no lights on stage. Goose, the guy who's the LD, the lighting director, he's sitting back there going, okay, is this what he wants? Does he want it black? Does he want stage lights? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Fuck me. Uh, this looks weird. And, and so the whole first song then was just washed in black. That was it. And, uh, and then I leaned into the microphone afterwards, glass crunching under my feet. Goose, can you throw some <clears throat> lights on the stage, please? That would be really cool. <laughs> and I could almost hear him laughing all the way in the back of the venue. And so we roll into the second song. Second song, lights are up, you know, okay, whatever. I blew out this light bulb and I'm getting really excited and I dive off into the crowd. I wasn't really paying attention to the fact that, oh, I'm going to be on stage. I dove off into the crowd. I had my glasses on. I had a hat on that I'd been wearing all day that I wouldn't have worn on stage. I was wearing my leather jacket. I didn't, you know, I didn't have stage clothes. It was just like, and I had the van keys in my back pocket. I had my wallet in my pocket. I had some other shit in there. And I dove into the crowd and the crowd was like, yes, and sucked me down. And this woman, uh, Jenny, who was um, sort of tour driving us around, she was like, holy fuck, she's gone. So I disappear and all of a sudden, boop, I pop back up. They had taken my hat one direction, my glasses the other direction. They were literally, someone's trying to take off my shoes. <laughs> And my jacket was coming <laughs> off and the van keys. And Jenny, who's about this big, comes powering into the audience like, that hat is his. Give me those fucking glasses. You put the van <laughs> keys back in his ass pocket. She like clears the whole path for me and shoves me back on the stage so hard. I just go ass over tea kettle onto the stage. It's like, I'm going to hold all this shit. Give me your fucking jacket, you dingbat. What are you doing? What is wrong with you? You're on stage. You're not driving the van. I laughed about that. And we finish the rest of the show <laughs> that tour was full of hilarious moments like that and the guy that was talking to me on patreon he was like man actually that there being no light on stage was kind of cool because we could see these figures moving around and then it was always your eyes <laughs> <laughs> and i just thought that That's was so awesome. funny one more moment from that tour that tour was full of really interesting moments and it's it's these first time moments that are so central and really build an important buttressing core to, to everything that one does. These first, we were in Cleveland, which then was still home for nails. And we were playing at the Fantasy Theater, which is about 1,500 people. And for years after that, we played at the Fantasy Nightclub, which is right next to it. And this awesome little nightclub that the mixing desk was in a half of a boat with like a, a mast and a sail on it. It was so fun to play and show low stage. You could be right up in people's faces. But we were playing at the Fantasy Theater and it was a goofy night. Jim Marcus and I had been goofing on Trent and how serious he could be. Jim said, you know, I, I'm gonna come out on stage with a, with a guitar that's not plugged in and, uh, and you know, pretend that I'm Trent for a second. You introduce me and, and he came out with a bag on his head and I said, and now on guitar, T Reznor. And he jumped around all barefoot with a guitar and you know, and then I don't know, stumbled off to the side and we finished the show. And as soon as we were done, John Malm, who was there, uh, who was Trent's manager at the time, he was there at the side of the stage, which he never was. He was always, you know, just helicoptering around Trent all the time. He was there at the side of the stage. And he said, we have to talk. Trent wants to see you right now. <laughs> Fuck. All right. I'm getting called to the fucking principal. Wow. Office. Yeah. Did you he use your upstairs. full name and everything? Oh, my God. And he was like, hey, man, that really wasn't cool at all. What you and Jim did, you know. I mean, it's my show, and it, it's really just, it's not how things are supposed to run, and I know we're friends, but, you know, that just, that was, that was really out of line. Uh, really? It just, it was a total, cool, it's your tour, and we're happy to be here, and I'm really sorry, I didn't need to step on your toes, I just thought it was kind of funny, and 
they rocked the show. I laughed about the whole thing. We were down in the club later on at the Fantasy Nightclub, and we were drinking. And he comes up to me and like, how was your show tonight? And I said, I had a great time. And, you know, sorry about, you know, doing the thing with Jim. He was like, ah, it's okay. It was pre-show and I was nervous. And, and so we hung out and drunk some more. And then we went outside to load all of our gear out. And it was snowing. And it was snowing just the most picturesque, huge tumbling snowflakes that just look like these gorgeous pancakes, all crenellated edges tumbling down. And it was a foot and a half of snow. And we're loading all of our gear out. And as we got all of our gear loaded out, I got biffed in the face by a snowball. And there Trent was like, fuck you, man. Whoop. So we started this huge snowball fight out there. D Warsaw and Nails and the, you know, all the roadies and Goose, the lighting guy and all of us. And we're just, we're in this huge laughing, screaming snowball fight. And I pile into the van because I figure in any good situation, you need some music. And I turn on the local radio station and I'm just catching the DJ who says, fantastic show tonight. I'll tell you, these guys just blew me away. I mean, Nine Inch Nails were amazing. But this band, let me play this for you. There's a song called Blunt Force Trauma. And it was the first time I had ever heard a Chem Lab song on the radio. In our van, snowstorm snowball fight with Nine Inch Nails in their hometown and snowballs just sort of going <laughs> past me and I'm in this dream sequence moment which was just perfect and everything kind of slowed down this dappled light from the street lights and the snow falling all over and I'm listening to my music coming out of the radio in the van and thinking you know if I get hit by a rock and I die right now, I'd be okay with that because this is just one of those perfect moments that you never forget. And I just watched it play out, listening to this dumb song of ours on the radio. Uh, wow, that was kind of perfect. That's yeah. fucking amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm just imagining awesome. like all of these huge names in industrial goth music running around and giggling incontrollably like children throwing snowballs at each other. That's just like yep. the most blissful image of, in my mind I can ever fathom. Yep, it was, and it was, it was perfect. It was just perfect. We, in fact, we hung out in, in that bar that night, Richard's brother. Richard Patrick, who went on to do Filter, uh, Piggy, as we knew him, his, uh, his brother came and hung out. We were talking to him. He said, yeah, man, I've been in Hollywood. Like, yeah, cool. All right. I've been there, too. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, really, I, I just uh, finished doing this film with um, Schwarzenegger. Like, <coughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you were. Yeah, definitely. He said, no, 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 seriously. Uh, you know, the Terminator film, I'm, I'm in the second one. And uh, like, yeah, okay cool and he's talking about yeah it was really weird i'm you know doing these scenes and throwing a stunt double of arnie through a wall and and they got me all turning into silver and everything and, and uh, i had to be like really you know uh, i had to work out every day so that i was strong enough to do this i mean i'm not picking up arnie they had this whole thing below his feet that sprung him up as i you know throwing him through a wall and we're just looking at him like there's a lot of fucking detail here if you're making this up, you're good. You're really good. <laughs> and then and T2 comes out, and we're, we all we went to see it. Um, Dylan and, uh, and I think Steve and I went to see it, and we're just agog. Like, holy that fuck. Happened. Oh. That's the guy. That's Piggy's brother. That's him. <laughs> wow. It's really weird. It was really strange. This bizarre moment. Yeah, throwing Arnie through a wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. Cool. Can I have some of what you're doing? Because it's really fucking strong. <laughs> Turns out it was true. Fucking Robert Patrick. Martin, do you have any stories from being on tour that you'd want to share? Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's... that's... <laughs> Uh, can I, can oh, I, go ahead. I, can, I, yeah. can I introduce this boy first? Look yeah. <gasps> yes. Jordy came to live with us on Wednesday. Look at him. Hi, Piggy. poppers. So, 
the the noise that was happening, which I was concerned about before, when he was squeezing the pig, Pen, Pen nipped out into the garden for a few minutes. And while she was out there, Geordie decided he didn't like the plant in the position it was on, on the table. It would look much <laughs> better laying on the floor. So he rearranged the plants in the living room. That was thoughtful. He's an interior designer. Yeah, Good I think dog. he's what doing it well. Um, do you want to go now? Yes. You, you <laughs> wait till you meet him, Jared. He's just beautiful. I'm ready. He only I'm ready. He only finished racing about three or four weeks ago. So really? He's, wow. Yeah, he's, he's hot to trot, but he's also <laughs> he's also. All right, you want to go out now, mate? Yeah. Go on. Then. No way, Dad. I'm hanging out here. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. He's, the stairs, the stairs is a massive thing for him. He's got to remember these, these guys have all they've ever done all their lives since puppies were race, 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 race. And suddenly, no, mate, this way. It's cut the <laughs> Good boy. Go on, downstairs. He uh, wants to go and record some vocals. He's going into the vocal booth. <laughs> I know he wants, mate, that's his, f the thing he loves to do most is look out the window. So we had to move the living, because the first thing he did when we got in, when we brought him in was he jumped on the table to look out the window. So now we've moved the sofa to in front of the window so he can sit on a sofa and look out the window. Because whatever the dogs want, the dogs get. So I will, I, I, do, I, I, do, I do have one really nice story I can tell, which doesn't incriminate anybody, doesn't make anyone look bad. We, I was with, we're, with Test Department when we were heading towards Prague for the last show of a European tour. I was driving, because there were only two of us. No, they're not two of us, right? I can tell. There were only two of us that could drive. There's me and Russ, our sound and producer guy. And we, so we, we did all, like, all the driving, and we, we drove to the border from Germany to uh, Czech Republic. It was snowing. There's always snow in a good tour story. So it was snowing. It was late. Well, we were late. So it was snowing. And we were late. We were always late. We were everything. We were always late for everything. So we got to the border. The guy came out. The soldier came out. He took our passports and stuff, and we were just sitting there. He came back. He read out that he's like mine, King. And I was like, Yeah, that's me. And he's like, Out. We got, we got out of the, the bus and he's like, you need to come with me. And we walked through to this tiny little hut thing where there were other soldiers sitting and they made me sit in a chair in the middle of the room. Um, I sat there for ages. Every, every, every now and then one of them would get up and leave the room and come back in. I'm sitting there like, well, what the fuck, what the fuck? And then a guy came in with my passport and he's like, you're Martin King? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I am, yeah. And he went, happy birthday! <laughs> <laughs> and they, they all sighed. Like, I was shitting myself. And that, I think that's a fair and kind and nice story because the other ones, someone's always going to not want to hear that one being told. So, Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's great. I love that they're just winding you up yeah. too. Oh, because, oh, that's because, awesome. Because we're, when we'd, we'd, we'd been in the old uh, East Germany and we'd, we'd been to some uh, sort of military shops because it was winter and we came ill-equipped for winter. We were English people. We just turn up wearing our whatever we want to wear and you're like, fuck, it's cold here. So we went to like second-hand military stores and bought big army jackets and stuff. We all looked very normal. And I think when we were all, we, we, we rocked up at the checkpoint and we're all sitting there with our German army uniforms on. They're like, oh, let's fuck with these people. Now, Martin, did you, did you tour with Test Department with all the big conundrum mechanism things? Hammers and sheet metal and shit. When I didn't join until 88, I think, 89, I think. So I didn't do some of those big shows that they did. Um, 
But there weren't, there, there weren't any test bomb shows which didn't involve horrible bits of metal and sheep shit that you had to drag around and somehow cram into the... You haven't been in test department until you've been driving down an Italian motorway in the tour bus with your, all your stuff crammed on a roof rack because you couldn't fit it in and a roof rack that you built yourselves because Paul knew how to build a pin roof rack. <laughs> uh, and you're driving along going, oh no, look, some poor fucker's lost all their luggage looking in the wing mirror of your, car, of your van. And then suddenly people flashing and everything were like, fuck, it's our luggage. <laughs> turning the, turning the, the next turn off and going back along the motorway going, oh, there's my bag, there's yours, Paul, there's yours, Graham. That sounds all too familiar. It's so amazing to watch live, but it's just seemed like a absolute nightmare. So a total nightmare. I think because I don't even like my amp. I don't even want an amp anymore. I'm we've done. done away with them. Fuck amps. All anti amp. Uh, I did. A, I did away with symbols <laughs> because I was fucked off with having symbols in front of me and no one knowing who the fuck I was. I was like, no one can hear the symbols because Paul's beating the shit out of a bit of metal with a hammer. What the fuck do I need symbols for? I did away with symbols, and, uh, and it, no, I think it was <laughs> less to think about, less to carry, less to... <laughs> yep, leave them by the side of the highway in Italy somewhere. There they go. It. So my last question was, I did a piece recently about what is that band, or in particular that album, that was so influential to you, that was just a big part of your musical experience and, and growing into it, but you don't like that genre at all. You, you don't really listen to anything else in that genre. You've never held intrigue for you, but this one album, for some reason, totally captured you. And for me, that was Fugazi Repeater. And I know, Jared, didn't, you played with Fugazi, right? You, you got to play with them once. So that was mine, but I would be interested for both of you to know, what is your album that was a big deal to you but nothing else in that style of music ever captured you in any way. My answer is going to be lame because there are, you know, plenty of influential ones, but none that are sort of, you know, the, the black horse or the unexpected sure. moment or, you know, the guilty pleasure. I like it all. And I keep coming back to all of it. I mean, even yeah. stuff, you know, that I don't listen to anymore. Uh, I, you know, it's not, it's not something, it's like a guilty pleasure that I'd be, I'd be, uh, nervous to, or not nervous, but embarrassed to talk about. You know, Django, our son yesterday or the day before said, I, you need to play some Hendrix for me. Uh, cause I've never <laughs> listened to any Jimi Hendrix and he's got really broad, broad taste. So I did. And, and I remembered how much I enjoyed in 1971 and two and playing, are you experienced over and 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 over again when I was 11 and 12. And, but I mean, I played a whole host of stuff then. I don't know. I still, I like it all. And um, it's, my taste is ridiculously broad and I don't think that there's anything that I look at and think, the, the hard thing is to say that I, I still wouldn't want to listen to it now. That, that, is this a thing which you go, well, I listen to that and I'm not sure I want to listen to it now? Or is it a thing you go, if I was to say, this is the album, that there's a particular album from when I, was, when I was growing up in my early teens, which I really liked, which wasn't fitting with the rest of the stuff I was listening to. Is that the kind of thing that... Yeah, not, that's what I'm looking say, for. I don't want to say that I wouldn't listen to it now. And it's when the tracks come on, I, I love it. Yeah, I played Fugazi Repeater the other day when I wrote this, and it fucking okay. slaps still. Yeah, okay, well, that's really good because that's kind of a little bit got more street cred than the one I'm about to punt out to you. So <laughs> Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. Oh, my God! I, I fucking love Frankie Valley. That is the first concert I ever saw in my life. Was oh, well, I was like go. seven years old, and my mom took me to Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. It's the first live music concert I ever saw in my life. So no shame here for me, brother. I there love. Well, I had uh, one of my one of my early albums that I had was uh, like a 
compilation of Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons, and I used to play it over and over again. And now I know where I get my love of harmonies from. That mm. is true. They have the best harmonies. Yeah. That's so yeah. funny. Like, but, yeah, I remember I was seven years old, and apparently I went to my mom and just, you know, she said, what do you want for your birthday? My birthday was coming up. And do you want a bike? Do you want a transformer toy, whatever? And I was like, I want to see Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons because my dad would play it on the oldie station all the time. And she goes, sweetie, I don't, they don't really play anymore. That, that I don't think. And sure enough, she opened up the Sunday paper and they were doing a reunion tour at Meadowbrook with Three Dog <laughs> Night. And she goes, all right, if the fucking oh. kid wants to go see Frankie Valley, I guess that's your birthday present. And it was like me and my mom and a bunch of people in their 40s and I, and I was just dancing Brilliant. my ass off on a blanket to Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons, and I went Brilliant. crazy and sang every song. I loved it. So I love yeah, it. No I love shame, brother. Brother. Okay. Three Dog Night. Holy Three Dog Night, yeah. The ink is black, the page yeah. is white. You know, yeah, yeah. Wow. I think they were actually headlining the tour, Three Dog Night. Frankie Valley was opening for them. They apparently, yeah, were the headline. I would have done it the other way, but yeah. This has been absolutely incredible. It's, it's been wonderful talking with everybody here. I wanted to say, too, you guys were so kind as to donate a T-shirt and all four albums that yeah, yeah. if you like this video and share it when the premiere comes out, then you will be in the running to win that drawing, and you can win all of these incredible albums. It's such a, a great project, guys. And I, I think it's amazing, too, when you know people, journeymen, that have been in as long as you and played this great career. Are you calling as old? To evolve. <laughs> no, I'm Experienced? not. I, it, it, hey, no, had, had a lot of experience and a lot of things happened, but that you guys are able to continue to evolve your sound. You know, not the fucking Rolling Stones that you're playing the same hits as you played in 1959 over and over again, that you guys continue to explore new ground change with the times and make something fresh and unique that's relevant today and i think that's extremely powerful i love this album i suggest to everybody that you go out get a copy of this album and listen to it and enjoy because it really taps into something primal and beautiful so thank, thank you both. You. That is beautiful. Thank you. Dude, you've got yourself a PR job that won't pay anything if you want it. <laughs> I I have a PR job. He's that on it. Pay anything. <laughs> I all on my own. I started, you know, I but I I love this. I love doing it and and part of that has been the relationships I've gotten to form through this like with you guys. So thank you very much everybody out there. Follow us on Facebook here where we're going to have more wonderful interviews like this. We have one coming up that I'm very, very excited for. I don't know if I should, you know, let the cat out of the bag already. Just the tail. Just the yeah, tail. Yeah, just give him, just okay, give him a little okay. hint. We're going to have Jean-Marc Letterman on for the next interview after this. Yes, of Gene Loves Jezebel, Front 242. I mean, just, I am... Again, like you guys, this is somebody that I grew up admiring. This new project that he has going is just mesmerizing. It's gorgeous. And everybody it's, he has on it, it's so good. I'm going to write a review before then and release it. But I'm excited for that one next week. And this has just been a true pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fun. I've enjoyed it. It's been like sitting in a room with your mates. I think that's how it should be, really. I agree. I agree. It helps that the questions are good. I've done a couple of interviews and <laughs> good questions are key. They really are. They're, they're not as plentiful as you would expect. You'd think people would come and, you know, they do their research and they want to know really interesting stuff. And so often it's just pablum. So thank you for thinking. Hope you guys enjoyed your, our episode today. Stay safe out there. And as always, Keep it dark, yo. Oh, it's always dark here. <laughs>
Your life on fire